Hello, Shamai. Did, did you enjoy that? Did you have a nice time? It's good, isn't it? It's almost as if they know what they're doing. It's amazing. Uh, fantastic. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for the welcome, Ed. Uh, it's lovely to be with you today um, to get a chance to sit down and chat about what you've just seen and also perhaps what's to come and what we've learned and all really exciting things uh, like that. So my name is Stefan. I'm going to slink over here. I think. Perfect. Uh, my name is Stefan and I'm... Um, very lucky because I get to lurk in dark places on the set of Doctor Who uh, and speak to actors and crew and stuff. And you're um, hopefully going to get to see the, uh, the fruits of our labour this weekend after the show. So I'm very excited to get your thoughts on that as well when we are out Doctor Who Unleashed on BBC Three and on the iPlayer. I got my plug in earlier, Russell, um, this weekend. Now, uh, it is, um, you're not here to, to speak to me. Uh, instead, we're here to hear from Russell T. Davis and Jane Tranter. So could you come to the stage, please? Thank you very much. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Now, we've got a lovely 40 minutes or so, and we're going to chat with Russell. Let me give you a bit of a, a sort of a, an idea of how this is going to work. So we're going to have a little chat now with, with Russell and Jane. And then in about 20 minutes or so, we're going to um, bring on some Screen Alliance Wales trainees up onto the stage and learn a little bit about, which is terrifying for you lot, because they've got questions for you, uh, to learn a little bit, well, and to discuss a little bit about getting into television in Wales and how perhaps there's people in the audience or people at home or whatever, you might want to take some lessons home in terms of how you could also end up working on a show like Doctor Who. Um, so I think we should start. I don't know, there's so many places to start. But I think after a week of, I'll start with you, Russell, if you don't mind, after a week of interviews where you've been asked a million different questions about Doctor Who, and this is probably one of your last things you could do before you can kick back and watch Saturday. Well, is that it? Yeah, nearly there <laughs> until Saturday. I suppose the obvious question to start with is, how do you how do you feel right about now? How's, how's the, what are your emotions? Oh, excited, probably. I mean, you've worked on these things for years. It's been 18, two years of working on this, so just excited. And I'm properly proud of it. It's like, I've got to say, when this goes out on Saturday night, this goes out. Then Doctor Who Unleashed goes out for half an hour, plus an awful lot of behind-the-scenes stuff on the website. We've got, like, 20-minute B-roll programmes going out on, on the BBC website. Plus, there's a Doctor Who podcast analysing this episode. Plus, there you will be able to go onto the iPlayer and watch an InVision commentary. You know, like you get DVD commentaries, InVision. We're not selling them on DVD anymore. They're going to free onto the iPlayer, not every week, but certainly for this week, and with David Tennant giving his own commentary on this. So I'm immensely proud of a vast pool of people. This isn't just a television programme arriving. It's like it's a whole empire of work and imagination and diligence and insight and... You know, we get to work, talking about the sore trainees and things, yeah, we get to work in edit suites in post-production houses that are genuinely staffed by people who say to us, oh, my God, I wanted to get to television because I watched Doctor Who Confidential. Hmm. So we've come back not just with a show, but a whole raft of opportunities to get... Is that Tommy? Hello, oh, no, love. I <laughs> knew you'd be here. Um, with a whole raft of insights into the profession, the profession that can say to anyone, come and do this, come and do this, there's nothing special about this, anyone can get a job on this, it's open, this show will run and run and more shows like it, invent your own shows, it is an open door to make this, the creativity of this country be seen all over the world. Yeah, and how much is it, you know, Jane, it's more, like Chris was saying, it's more than telly now, and how much was that part of the conversation when you, in the first instance we thought, right, we're going to come back, Russell's coming back. We've heard the story about the, the tweet along and how everybody got excited. But when those conversations were having, it was like, you know what, if we're coming, then you, to quote my brother-in-law, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly bear. And you're coming back with all of these amazing extras as I well as the it. show. Yeah. yeah, if you're going to be a wolf, be a bear. That's right. it, that's it. On brand, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very um, good. Russ no, Russell was really clear right from the start that if we were going to come back, if these old faces were going to come back again, then we were going to come back and do something which was as big as it could possibly be. And that's not just about a supersized Doctor Who program, which, as you can see from that, it it is bigger than it was before. But Russell was really clear he was going to come back and do the Hooniverse. And, and so all of those other things that Russell describes were part of what he said to Julie and myself right from the start. This, if we're going to come back, we're going to be all in and this is what we're going to do. And two years later, slightly tarder, teeny bit older, you know, that is what we've done. 
Yeah, and what is that experience then? Because it's more than just, you know, more than just making a show. In terms of as an exec producer, how does that change the workload? How are you thinking differently about this programme, more than just 60 minutes or 56 minutes or whatever of, of linear television? Um, in, in some ways, I mean, what, what Russell did, he was, he was so clear and so determined right from the start. And he sort of kicked open every door that there was to kick open and we follow through. And often when you're an executive producer of a big show, one of the hardest things is to try and get all those other things around it. Because these days it's not just about, if you're doing a big franchise show, it's not just about one thing, it's about the many. Mm. And you often have to go around begging for the many or kind of like proving your worth. And Russell was kind of like, he was absolutely determined and he's never flagged on that. You know, he's not let anything go that if we're going to do it, this is what we're going to do it. And it's meant that it's created so many opportunities in so many different fields to be able to support the wonder that is Doctor Who. But you don't just watch the television program. There's masses of other stuff to look at, too. So that's very different, Russell, as opposed to your previous experience of running Doctor Who. Are you having fun doing it? Oh, God, yes. Oh, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun. It's enormous fun. I mean, some people make dramas. It can people. sound stressful as well. well but, you know, you could be making dramas with no, people being... No, no, <laughs> no. A lot of dramas are about people being murdered in alleyways. And this is a lot more fun than that. Yeah. And um, and there is a joy about it. What we love about making this show is that we know it's Hello, H from Steps, with your children there. And it's like, but we know it's like a children's show. That um, And that's the same for our crew. They come onto the set, their kids watch it. And also their dads and mums and dads watched it. So there's the, it is very different. I've worked on other shows. I've worked on nine o'clock dramas and all sorts of things. And it's a very different feel on this because there's a real pride in it. There's a Welsh pride, but there's a family pride. It's where you know something, you make working on something that's going to put a smile on people's face. Hmm. and that your kids are probably going to love or that your granddad knew. I mean, to have that intergenerational span is a very rare phenomenon. So there's a proper joy on set. People yeah. love it. And do you think there is still a space? Because we all watch television right now in the sense that it's getting quite niche, isn't it? Everybody's super served for their thing that they love, whether it's yeah. it could be science fiction or it could be true crime drama or whatever. How convinced are you that there is a space for a drama, a programme like this that does span those generations, that does bring families together? Well, we'll find out. It's very, you know, this <laughs> is a very good point. Yeah. Because this is a new start. It's, it's, it's like it's going to drop. When it arrives on Saturday night, it'll drop all over the world on Disney+. Plus. It's on BBC in Britain, on the iPlayer. The rest of the world, it's on Disney+. Plus. It's a soft launch on Disney+. Plus. The big launch is going to come with Shooty's first season. If you're thinking, why well, you haven't seen great big adverts so across the world on Disney+, Plus now, that will come next year. They're going to do the big push. Um, we're starting with the 60th anniversary, which makes more sense in Britain, mm. let's be honest. Um, but um, I think it deserves that. And that's part of the reason I came back to it. And, and it is fun, but I genuinely believe you, you watch... When we arrived in 2005 there wasn't that much science fiction on. In fact, we kind of paved the way, especially for British science fiction. And if and science fiction in America was things like Lost, very serious think pieces. Yeah. And, um, and I just honestly believe there is room. You do, I've watched things like Stranger Things and all the Marvel shows and Star Wars things getting acclaim, and I love those shows. And I thought we, Doctor Who is as good as those. It has a heart as good as those. I think it's better than those, to be honest. And we'll find out. But um, certainly, I think we're not done badly in this room. So yeah. if you just <laughs> replicate this across the world, that would be marvellous. Yeah. Times this by a few million, and we'll be, yeah. we'll be in business. <laughs> Coming back, what's been the big difference for you, Jane, compared to when you, you know, first brought the world of Doctor Who back onto our screens. What's been the big sort of change this time around? Well, well, personally for me, the big change is when we did Doctor Who in 2003, I was the drama commissioner. So I was the one who, I took a different level of responsibility for it, which I absolutely love doing. Um, but now I am taking a producing responsibility you know, mm -hmm. bad wolf is taking a producing responsibility for it and um and i i don't do it on my own joel collins one of the executive producers is sitting here phil collinson who was a producer on the original series an executive producer and of course my best friend and colleague julie gardner she who would be here tonight russell said to me just as we were sitting down how much julie would have loved to have been here absolutely loved to be but it's thanksgiving as she says what better place to celebrate doctor who day than on a day that also celebrates thanksgiving so yeah and lots 
a turkey. If you're a big turkey fan, it's a perfect oh, day for you. Oh, she loves a turkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she, she, There's she another spoiler for you. No, look at that. They're coming yeah. thick and fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so that that personally, the big difference is I'm in it day in, day out, which um, which I've completely loved doing. But I think the 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 big difference really is that it's it's the year is 2023, and television's changed since we started making it in 2003, and and how we are approaching Doctor Who, including. Um, including how we're tackling the effects and how we're tackling the action sequences. It's all different. And it means that when Russell... I mean, there will never be a time and there will never be a budget that means that when Russell slips a script onto the table in front of us, we don't go, whoa, how are we going to do that? <laughs> and the very day that happens is the day that, you know, we've all gone wrong in our different ways. But it does mean we have a better chance of running to keep up with him. And as you can see, we do have to puff and pant behind him quite a lot. But that, I think, is is a significant difference, isn't it? Yeah, I guess the same for you then, Russell, when you're writing it, because obviously you're, well, the, the, the dimensions of, of the, your, the, the, the sandbox that you're playing in, I suppose, is very different now than it was when you first started. It's this. different. It's not that different. You can imagine that on a little... You could have... David and Catherine would have run around the streets and thought of me. Maybe the meat would have been... A man in more furry skin or something, but we'd have made that in the old days. It's 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 like it's it really is the same show. Feel feels very well. It feels the same to write it, but it feels like twenty twenty three. This would be the same whatever you're writing. It feels like today, mm. and 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 that's important. But um, and yeah, of course, I can spread my wings a bit more and and know that other people would bear the pain, the terrible pain. <laughs> but um, but it, equally, it's like we always try to go too far. We always have to cut back. It's the same yeah. old thing. Really. So perhaps for you then, it's more. That society's changed in the last twenty years, and you want to reflect that, which is quite, you know. I suppose it's never not going to change, is mm. it? And and I hope my I try to keep doing that. I think it keeps you young, frankly. It's like trying to write what the world is now. I don't. I feel that very much as as a gay man. Actually, it's like one of the one of the one of the things that drives me mad, and I'm also very glad of, is that whenever you get an election or some fuss in the news, someone will bring up homosexuality or rules about gayness or things, gay rights, things we're allowed to do. And suddenly we all have to sit there and defend ourselves and, 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 and say why we're allowed to exist. And we have to hop about like cats on a griddle saying why we're allowed to even stand in a public square and mm. be yourself. But although that's terrible, I kind of think, well, at least it keeps me in tune with what's going on. It's like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not infinitely wise in everything, but um, I kind of think that the, 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 the progressive politics keeps you open to the state of the world, the state of things that's happening, and I'm glad of that, actually. Yeah, because even though Doctor Who is a, a programme that travels space and time, it is political with a small p at, at times, isn't it, in terms of the stories that yeah, it tells? I think it's... Uh, with the capital P, sometimes I think I think, and that's and that's not that's not to be progressive. That's a, it's just like breathing. That's who we are. That's how you live in the world. Mm. That's what these kids here will be. As the, that's where they're, what they're growing up in. That's will shape the future. It's I can't. I don't understand programs that don't do that. To be honest. Yeah. But actually, that goes to the point. You know, the question that you asked. You know, do you think that people will want to watch? something where families can join together and watch it in this way. And actually part of the reason they will is because Doctor Who is so multi-layered. Mm. You know, there's so many different things that you can take away from it. And it's always been like that mm. with you, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so there's there's the gags and the action at the top, and then there's the messaging yeah. somewhere in the middle in the, in the yeah. bottom as well. And yeah. the characters and the emotion. Of course. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I often think the gags and the action are for the adults and the messaging for the kids, <laughs> actually. It's that yeah. way around. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, can I ask a question about Wales uh, and Wales? Is, I've just come from um, the Bay where they've got this brilliant new light and water show. So yeah. people, yeah. it looks pretty cool. It's pretty yeah. jazzy. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty jazzy, I have to say. So obviously you haven't had a chance to watch it yet because you, you've been here watching Shut the show, up. which is... You know, fair, I, I understand why you've made that call. It's fair enough. I, I get it. Fine. Um, but you've got plenty of time to go down there. It's on every half an hour from half past five to half past nine all weekend. Anyway. Um, and uh, Doctor Who water feature. Yeah, it's, it's, it looks really clever and, the, and there's music involved and it's fantastic. But everybody there is very proud of the fact that Doctor Who is made here in Wales and has such a Welsh footprint on it. Is that something, Jane, you think that...
say in the Welsh Senate where they were looking at the economic impact that Doctor Who had had in Wales, and it was it was it was that, and it was celebrating. Um, what Doctor Who has brought to Wales, and it was celebrating the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. And I just felt afterwards, I, I mean, I loved every minute of it, and I loved hearing about the, the amount of money that the show has brought to Wales and the number of jobs it's created. Mm. But I also wondered, you know, it, for Doctor Who's 70th anniversary, you know, touch wood, Doctor Who will have its 70th anniversary and it will be in Wales. And at that point, I think we need to start, we need to stop thinking about how lucky Wales is to have Doctor Who and actually how lucky Doctor Who is to have Wales. Mm. Because, there, you know, people often ask, wasn't it a, an enormous risk to to put Doctor Who in Wales in 2003. And I suppose if I've been thinking about it, yes, it was, but I didn't think about it. I just thought that's where Russell and Julie are. And it's a studio space and why not? Yeah. You know, it was clear there was a production and creative community here. And I've never doubted Wales. And, and Wales has not once in all of the many shows now that have been very innovative and ambitious. You know, I've never once doubted it. I've never once been let down. And I feel just very lucky that we've been able to do the things that we have here rather than saying everyone should be so lucky that we have. Hmm. And also, it's, it's nice and convenient from the mumbles, isn't it, oh, Russell? Yeah, yeah, which is quite, which is quite which handy. Which is really Which is well quite handy, it, isn't yeah. it, to be fair? You can have your ice cream on the pier there and then get up into set. Uh, for you, Russell, do you think about the lo location at all, or where it's made, or who makes it? Because I've been struck being on set, because I've you know, been on a handful of film sets in my time, but... It's amazing just how many Welsh people are there. It wasn't something I was I really thought about, even though I knew it was made in Cardiff. It wasn't something I thought about really until I was there and I saw it in front of me. Yeah. But is this something you? I think it's been, No, I think it's, it's completely wonderful. And that's why I was always behind bringing it here. It was Jane's idea, but in 2005, I can remember when I was young and I was out playing in the street. And my dad was standing in the door, going, "Come and see, come and see Margaret Johns on the television." He said, because it was, and she was on an episode of Z Cast, because it was so rare to see a Welsh person on the television. We went running indoors yeah. to watch Margaret John on Z Cast. So I do think that the whole visibility thing is absolutely vital. A show card. That's why we put Torchwood in the middle of Cardiff underneath that silver tower. Mm. No one can remember the name of that silver tower anymore. It did have a name of <laughs> 20 years ago. Now it's just the Torchwood Tower. Yeah. It says that on Google Maps, Torchwood Tower. <laughs> it's great. So, um, and I believe in that. I believe in branding ourselves onto the, onto, the, um, onto the landscape and knowing that those shows then travel all across the world. And you meet people who've travelled from Canada and all those places. You know, you meet them in the Bay. They've come to see where Doctor Who is made. I think that's a brilliant thing. And what they were saying today in the Tenth was that that the the Doctor Who's bought 134 million pounds into Wales. I think it's completely wrong. I did the sums and it's five times that. I genuinely think <laughs> they issued a cautious and naturally cautious and careful yes. response. Was actually I totted it all up, but it's like because what it means. The thing I was saying today is that. Um, you know, if you make if you make a crime show, that average episode of crime show is about two million quid. So people say it costs two million quid, and then the Daily Mail complains that it costs two million quid. But actually, what that two million quid—it's not spent on champagne and glitter. What that two million quid means is that it goes to the grips and the riggers and the drivers and the carpenters and 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 the actors and the secretarial staff and the drivers of the cars and the taxis. It goes into the hotels. It goes into the shops. It goes into the bars. It goes into the supermarkets where everyone shops. It goes into rent. It's like all that money, all of it goes back into the city. So it's a phenomenal thing to do, to have a production base in a city. Mm. Now, in a couple of moments, we're going to bring our SOAR trainees up onto the stage to have a little chat with us as well and ask a couple of questions of, um, of Jane and Russell. But before I bring them on, can I ask you, Jane, if there was a moment in your early career that you look back upon now, perhaps with the beauty of hindsight, and think, oh, that, that was it. That was a pivotal moment. That was a big thing that happened to me that ended up snowballing into this position that you're now you know, executive producer of this program and you co-founded Bad Wolf. Oh, well, well, part of the reason that we call Bad Wolf Bad Wolf was because when we were thinking, I mean, I was sitting in New York for month after month after month in studios there, and um, and I I was on a film set the whole time watching a director film an eighth of a page a day, so I had a lot of time to think, and thought 
I'm going to get the hell out of Dodge. Um, and, and I need to start working for myself and, and doing something differently. And Julie and I were talking about what we were going to do um, and decided we were thinking about where we would start an independent production company where we set it. And part of the reason we call the company, well, actually, the yeah, main part of the reason we call the company Bad Wolf with Russell's permission was because when we look back, it looked like everything, every road had led to this point. Mm -hmm. Every decision that we'd made together and separately suggested that one day we would, I would come back from LA and I'd come to Heathrow and I'd turn left rather than turn right and, and be in Wales. Um, I, I can't, you know, I'm not, I don't look back that very often. Um, I'm a relentlessly forward looker and, and I don't ponder an awful lot over decisions. The bad wolf one I only know because I've been asked that question so many times and I had to articulate it. Um, so I don't think so. I mean, for I'm not a great believer in really thinking loads about your career. I, well, at least for me, I've just moved by instinct and I've been phenomenally lucky. And when I've hung around for too long, someone's always given me a kick and said, actually, you know, you should leave the BBC. You should leave ITV. You should go to America. You should come back from America. Mm. At the moment, no one's kicking me to leave Bad Wolf. And honestly, I won't until someone does. I'm, yeah. I'm in here now. That's, that's, that's it. And well done for tackling the M4 of the Heathrow as well, because it can be quite treacherous. Yeah, well, it took, took years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Russell, and then the same question to you then, before I ask Abdul and Luke to come up on stage. Yeah, I think I've been very lucky over the years and, and worked with, I had an amazing, in the 90s, I worked at Granada, it was a very special place. But actually, I think it goes way back to like 1987. I was asked to join the children's department in Manchester. I was, I did, I'd done like odd jobs for them and then I had a chance to move to Manchester on a six month contract and I would I think because there were young people here I could see young people in the crowd and um, to work for children's was absolutely astonishing and changed my life because the marvellous thing about children is it hasn't got any money it hasn't got it's got nothing it's tough and so you end up doing every job you get literally thrown into every single job within six months I've been in I was in the edit suite I was in dubbing I did OBs I did PSC singles camera shoots we did live studios multi-camera studios everything I knew how to write scripts so those that's what's got me right I started you know magazine shows need scripts so those were the first scripts I was writing were magazine scripts just never pay a writer and then I was a, made a script editor on a comedy show. We couldn't afford writers, so I just wrote it all myself. And um, it's terribly unprofessional now, I realise. But um, it's like, <laughs> at the time, there was, was, there was yeah. no money. There was yeah. no money to tell it otherwise. So it's like, I always think that was the best grounding I have had. And actually, in terms of the experience, it's, it's like, because if it was raining, there was no way you'd stop. If something fell through, there's no way you'd stop. And you carry that through, actually, into you can be on a great big high budget show like this, but those rules are still the same. It's raining, yeah. you've got to keep going. Yeah. And that's a really, it's the most brilliant grounding I could possibly have as a BBC Children's. It was absolutely wonderful. Yeah, amazing. Well, listen, let's give a round of applause to Abdul and Luke. We're going to come up on stage, please. If you come, lads. They're not at all embarrassed now. So, Abdul and Luke are our Screen Alliance Wales trainees. They're working um, in different uh, departments on uh, the show, on Doctor Who at the moment. Instead of me butchering, Abdul, what you're up to at the moment, why don't you tell people what your job is on set at the moment and how you got there? Hi, my name is Abdul, and I'm director's assistant in Doctor Who. And tell us a little bit about what a director's assistant does. Um, just trying to keep the directors alive most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I thought that, that was the producer's <laughs> job. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the main things for me is just making sure during prep and production and post-production, make sure everything is okay. And a lot of the time, you just take it as it comes. Yeah. You know? uh, most of the time, I just wake up in the morning and call the director, find out where they're going to be. If they're going to get there for an hour early or if they're going to be there half an hour early, make sure I'm there on time, etc. Yeah, well, that's very, very so diligent of you, isn't so it? How diligent that is. It's that absolutely is invaluable because directors, they, they're a law unto themselves. They can go anywhere. Yeah. And actually having someone, and, and they're, they're, it's one of the very few jobs where your, create, your creativity happens in public mm. and, and they need so much help scooping up around them and we need help to understand yes. them. And Abdul is... Utterly brilliant in doing all of that. Yeah. Um, now, before we get on to how you ended up in that position, Abdul, yeah. I just want to ask Luke the same question. Luke, tell us a little bit about what you're up to on, on set and what's your job at the moment. Um, so I'm a scenic artist, uh, which means I paint the sets uh, for Doctor Who. So all the things you saw there, 
but not that episode. I didn't work on that one. I, you, I started you, can, with you can the, roll with it if you want, Luke. Do they want? No, it's fine. <laughs> I, I did everything in yeah, that yeah. episode. That was all me. So. <laughs> um, so I work construction hours, so it's different hours to the shooting crew. I go in earlier in the morning, and we start earlier than the shooting crew in general. Like we, We'd start building a set a few weeks beforehand because we need to be done before the shooting crew gets there. If I'm there at the same time as uh, Abdul, we've done something wrong because <laughs> we're leaving a little bit late. Um, but yeah, it's, it's painting, there's sculpting, there's, I mean, all different stuff. Sometimes it's literally picking up like mud and sand and throwing it around, just getting the finish that you need. And it, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's, yeah. It's amazing. I love it. Now, so the, 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 one of the things that struck me when I first went on the set of Doctor Who is how amazing the sets are. And that must be fun when you've written it in your mind and you see the work of people like Luke have done oh. and you turn up. Oh, my God. I was just going on the sets today. That chamber, which is like just oh. extraordinary. The secret chamber that none of you so know about. Chamber. So well there's painted. <laughs> and there's that thing hospital <laughs> that's, that's, it's beautiful it's absolutely <laughs> i just love it honestly i come to work sometimes and think, oh i'm just gonna have a wander around the studios i'm gone for an hour we've got seven sound stages they're enormous it used to be six now it's seven and it's just lovely isn't it it's yeah great. it's fun spending time with them because you you get a sense of place lucas thinks your job is a really amazing creating a sense of place that must be really helpful for the actors then isn't it to get lost in those spaces so Abdul, let's, let's go back to you how did you know about the job of a because of a director's assistant is that something that you'd always aspire to did you stumble upon it tell us a little bit about that story um to be honest i kind of stumbled upon it um, yeah i didn't have a clue how to get into tv and i've always asked a lot of people how did you get into tv and most of the time the answers you get is not really that direct and yeah the one thing that i started doing was being an essay and then being on set. So an essay for people who don't know the lingo is... Supporting artists. Supporting artists. Yes. So if you've seen the TV show Extra, that was Abdul, basically, was back in the day. In the background yeah, right. there. Yeah. yeah. And then one day, one of my friends told me about Screen Alliance Wales, how that's the, only, that's the best way to get through the in industry. Mm -hmm. And then the job came up as a director's assistant and I applied for it. Amazing. And so uh, when you were... Yeah, look at that. Let's give it Abdul a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> okay. And that is... Some leap of faith, Abdul, to go yeah. from someone who thought to herself, I have no idea how to get into telly, and then here you are as a director's assistant now. Yeah. When you were essaying, when you were working as a supporting actor, did you sort of investigate working in the, in the industry more? Did you let it, what, how, did that help at all? I mean, I've done my research, and I think when I found out I got the interview, one of the first things I did was ask who the director's assistant was on that set. Mm -hmm. And then his name is Jamie Winter King. And then um, he, he just said, look, I'll sit down with you at the end of the day for five to 10 minutes. We can talk about it, We're ready for the interview. If you have any questions, you can ask me. So I waited for him at the end of the day in the car park. He came over. He goes, oh, you still here? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then um, we went for a coffee. We just sat there for 10, 15 minutes talking about it. And he just gave me some pointers, what to expect during the interview, and also what the job entails itself. Mm -hmm. What about you then, Luke? How did you end up as a, working in the, in the art department then? Um, well, I, I think I saw on Twitter, or X as it's called now, but yeah. um, I saw a post for a, a trainee position um, in the art department and um, I applied for it and was rejected. And then I saw Screenlines Wells was hosting a foot in the door day in Newport. And I was like, right, I'm going to go down in person. And I took a portfolio. And I think I even had a model Dalek in it as well. Which Who hasn't got a model Dalek in it? Come on. Um, Very good. And I, I spoke to Bethan there. And then she gave me Sarah's email at Screen Alliance. And then I proceeded to email Sarah for about five months every week. <laughs> Just let me come do work experience. Let me come do work experience. Just nonstop. And then I finally got in. Um, and that was with prop fabrication, which is a different department than mm -hmm. where I'm working now. And they gave me one week of work experience. And then two days into that, I talked myself into a second week. And then one day after that, they asked to keep me on paid. Amazing. <laughs> Let's give Luke a round of applause. Look at that. What a story. And Jane, Luke's point there about rejection. T television, I think, is is a, is a difficult industry to get into. We know that. But also, how, how important is it to be able to deal with 
a no sometimes. That a no isn't necessarily a closing of the door. You must have been told no at times in your career, right? Very, very rarely. Very rarely. <laughs> I've, I've failed a lot, but rarely do I get a no. Yeah. Um, no, no, seriously, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And I was, I was just thinking, as Luke was telling that story, I was just thinking for anyone here who's looking to get into the television industry, that is exactly what you've got to do. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very hard thing, because when you say, well, you've just got to keep trying, actually sometimes your confidence doesn't want you to try anymore or your finances mean that it's very difficult to get to Newport or whatever mm -hmm. it is to, to go and do. But I think the, the thing that comes through from what Luke was saying is Luke was passionate about what he wanted to do. He knew he wanted to work in television. He was passionate about it. And eventually, that really does get through. It, 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 it does shine through. And, and I'm sorry it took five months, but what a result in the end. And, and you know, it shows the strength that you got another week after your first week and, and two days in you, to your third week, you were invited to stay permanently. And lucky us, I think. Lucky us for both of you. Yeah. What about you, Russell? Do you have any knockbacks when you were writing a children's or before then? Maybe? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think the wisest thing you said was that you, and when you talked to that bloke, you, you stayed in the car park. Stay. Yeah. Be there. Absolutely, in the cold, but just be there. And um, when I was describing my early days in children's, when I said you do editing and dubbing and all sorts of things, but that was me putting my hand up going, I'll do that. We need to do this, I'll do that. Everything just told me as I walked into my first dubbing suite and did a McLaren, written a script and written a dubbing script. And they laughed at me, they took the mickey out of me, and, and, and then, but then I said, well, show me how to do it then. And then they really liked me because I just thought, I was so diligent. I was so diligent, I was to fill in the fourth number on a dubbing script. <laughs> you know the frames at the end. <laughs> so I thought you had to do that, <laughs> and um, so just it's being there, yeah. isn't it? Is that once you get a chance? I know you've got to get that chance in the yeah. first place, but once you're there, make the tea, do all of that, make yeah. the tea, and talk to people, and just be there and see it. And there's there's so many opportunities. You know, there are dream, there are jobs you don't quite dream of. You didn't know there was a director's yeah. assistant. It's like there's all sorts of things you can do, and it's exciting. Making the tea is great advice. Mm -hmm. I, I passed that. When people wanted to get into the journalism world, they asked me that similar questions like, make tea. I don't care if you drink it. Learn to make tea, because loads of people do. Um, now, instead of me prattling on asking questions, I think, Luke, you and Abdul, you've got questions yourselves for, for Jane and Russell. So anybody who wants to go first? Abdul, do you want to go first? I'll go first. Yeah, you go fine. first. What's your question? I think one of the things that, before I found out the job, um, I think a lot of people have always asked me, how did you get into TV? And what sort of advice would you give someone who's not experienced enough, who's never been to uni, who hasn't got any degree in drama, how can they get on TV? Mm. And I always try and explain to, me, to them my own way of my experience so far. I'm still new to the industry. So I guess my question is, what advice would you give someone who's trying to get into the industry and sort of the ways to overcome the challenges as well that come with it? It's a great question, but Abdul, you've got to stick to being a director's assistant because my job is asking questions. <laughs> Sorry. So um, if you could not try and steal my I mean, I'm job, I'm always as well, asking them questions nonstop. Uh, what do you think of that then, Russell? Start with you. Well, again, it's exactly what you're saying about being there and asking those questions and doing it, and and you can do a lot more now about um, if you look in a city like this. For example, there's this, where, anywhere where there's a big student population, there are students making short films. That's absolutely there. If you go online, you'll find sites where they are. And they will need help. They will, do, for no money. I do, I, I hate saying this, but the stuff I did, first of all, I did do for no money. The first scripts I ever wrote, I did for no money. You've got to be very careful not to be taken advantage of in terms of mm. that. So in some ways, that's not good advice. But, um, but nonetheless, there, there, there are, you know, there are the bastions of, of the BBC and Bad Wolf, but there's all sorts of other areas. So there are students making films out there in every single city. And if you just go online, you'll, you'll find where they are. They, 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 they're always asking for crews. They're always asking for help. So that's a very good way of getting in and building up a bit of a showreel and get, getting to know those people and, and, and looking for opportunities like Saw and things like that. But it's, it's, the short film route is quite underestimated, I think. There's a lot of work out there that way. Yeah, can you, you remember think? a short film you, you would have helped out on years ago, Jane? Is that good advice, do you think? Um, no, I think it, I think it is. I think it is good advice. Um, definitely. Um, I I would just say a couple of other things. The first thing is, um, you know, you mentioned well, you haven't been to uni. 
For me, that is the least important thing. I, 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 I think you know. I've maybe never been asked my qualifications yeah. in my entire I, I think not, career. Honestly, not never. only is it not important. I mean, I never look at whether or I not do someone's go to school kids, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> school, school, yes, school, yes. But I just, super important. Yeah, I, n- I never, never look at, never look at whether someone's been to university. And, and if, if they had, I would definitely, honestly, if they've been to university and put their grade down, for me, that would be kind of like a mark against. It's kind of like get over yourself. You know, I'm not in. I'm what I'm interested in is what what you are interested in genuinely and mm-hmm. what you're passionate about. Um, so do not worry. I would say if you haven't been to university, that is not important. And indeed, there are many places these days. You know, many um, digital companies which actively don't want people to have been to university. They want them to start working earlier. Mm. Um, so it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Just bear that in mind. But the other thing is persistence and and target what you do. So you know, remember that producers don't mind a bit of flattery. So if you if you want to work in television, watch television. Watch television the whole time. Don't come to meet for a job and say you want to work in television and then you can't think of something that you like or you know have a view on television. If that's what you want to do, watch it. And and look and see at the bottom of the show who's the production company who's made it. You know, it's Hartswood. Maybe you love everything about Hartswood. Go online, look at the Hartswood website, discover that it's Sue Virtue. You should be, you know, you know who, who's the, the woman behind it and, and get in touch with her directly. A bit of specificity can take you a long way, I yeah. would say. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that, those bits of advice. What about you then, Luke? What's your question? Um, I had two questions, if I can be cheeky. I had one about uh, advice for trainees. Um, which is you were talking about rejection and I faced rejection myself and I love Doctor Who so much that was what kept me going and that's what made me be persistent but if you had any advice for uh, facing rejection like that and how to sort of motivate yourself to keep working through it it's a fine but it's an interesting balance isn't it Luke between knowing when you're pestering someone isn't it if you've just been said no yeah They've got other things going on. Where's the line between pestering and also being enthusiastic and yeah, sort of... Yeah. Uh, I, this, uh, this is slightly different advice. It's something I always say to young writers. I get a lot of writers saying, how do I start out and how do I get going? And actually, and it's, this is a tough bit of advice, but I, say, I do always say to them, you've got to sort yourself out. Because if you're the sort of person who says, oh, I'm always late, actually, if to be blunt, if you have a drink problem, if you have something wrong in life, it's like, it's not going to work. And I've worked with so many young writers who've had so much promise and they've been dazzling and brilliant. But frankly, they start drinking at 6.30 and 10 years later, they've vanished. They've gone. Because it's a tough game. It's a long game. It's very, very hard work. All right, it's not like being a nurse or a teacher. But nonetheless, the hours are long. And it's very diligent. And, and I don't mean just drug problems or drink problems. I, I do mean the sort of people who go, oh, I'm always late. I can't bear people who say I'm always late. It's like, and, and that's be. not going to work for you, <laughs> but actually, it's going to really ruin your job if you if you're if you if you're in that kind of mindset. Or uh, God, we were talking about someone today who just gets tired and says, "Oh, they're flacking," and they're not going to stay in work for long, are they? It's 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 a young it's it's like it's tough work. So you've got to be ready for it. And if you have something in your psyche that uh, that you've just got to iron things out, I know therapy is expensive, but uh, but the, I mean the kind of therapy, but it's like looking at yourself, or talking to your friends, and talking to your mates, and talking to your family, and just ironing out those kinks in yourself that might affect how you do a job. I I, I think it's also I'd also say it's about recog- recognizing when something's gone wrong. So I I have I have failed repeatedly during my my career and and as a result of what I have not been able to do I have thought about it I'm not going to say it necessarily makes you stronger but it makes you act differently next time and I think if you have been rejected from something it's very easy to get into well I've been rejected because it you know because I I don't know so and so or the odds are struck against you actually the more jobs you apply for the higher and the more jobs you get rejected from the higher the percentage possibility that the next one will be the one for you and you've got to find a way of of keeping moving forward with it because otherwise it it, it won't happen 
And if you get rejected, always remember, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Listen, we are out of time. Luke, you had a second. Was it a super quick oh, yeah. question? Yeah. Was it like a one-sentence answer type question? No. Okay. <laughs> Luke, hold that thought. Next time you bump into uh, Russell making him a cup of tea in the office, then it's fine. I know he's the boss, but I'm being I'm being nodded very aggressively down here to wrap us up. I, it's Why? Not, it's it, a long chain poly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not you. They know that we won't give a one-sentence answer. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah, well, listen, everybody, can we have a big round of applause, for, please, for Luke, Abdul, Jane, and Russell. Thank you very much.